you're all very, you're all very welcome. Um, I'm delighted to be doing this, needless to say, though I'd much prefer to be speaking to you in person. Thank you for giving up this lovely summer evening. Um, we're extremely lucky in the travel department. We managed to go to Japan generally every 18 months. Um, we'd go for either the autumn colour or we go for the cherry blossom, which of course is at its height. Um, years ago when we went, it was usually the end of April. Now, of course, because of global warming, we're heading into the end of March. We hope to go. We had hoped to go this year in March, but instead it will be next year, I'm afraid. Um, the cherry blossom is just sublime. It lasts for a very, very, very short time. But of course, although we're mainly a gardening group and interest in gardening, we don't just go for the cherry blossom, we go for the whole Japanese experience. Um, I'm in, totally in love with Japan. I lived there for a couple of years, about, oh, about 300 years ago, it seems now. And I'm very fortunate to be going back so regularly. Um, everybody thinks the journey is the hard part, but we're lucky travel department chooses to send us through Emirates, which although it's a long flight is extremely comfortable and uh, really very easy to navigate. And um, we stopped during uh, in Dubai. And um, so quite, quite uh, manageable the whole trip. Um, and we fly overnight, of course. So, and Japan is about eight hours ahead. Um, it's interesting, there's so many, I, I heard a very good talk from the Japanese ambassador a couple of months ago, stating the similarities between Japan and Ireland. Both island uh, countries, Japan, of course, is made up of several islands, four main ones. And our tour is based on Honshu, um, Ireland is a saucer with mountain around the edge. Japan is the opposite. It has mountains down the centre and all of the population live along the coast. Um, we start in Kyoto and we move, we land of course in Osaka, start in Kyoto, move up to Mount Fuji, then on to Tokyo and fly home from there. Um, it's interesting, uh, Kyoto, it's a very, it's a very, I'm sorry, my, my uh, screen is jumping along on its own here. So pardon the back, going backwards. We start in Kyoto. Um, Kyoto is an amazing city. And in some strange way, it reminds me of both Rome and Bath, a city surrounded by seven hills and very low buildings. Um, of course, one of the most historical cities in Japan. It was originally the capital before Tokyo. It was a cap, Kyoto actually is Japanese for capital city. Um, very modern, but not high rise, very manageable. Population of about 1 million, just over 1 million. And a fantastic history of gardening. If you visited every garden in Kyoto every day, for every day and spent every day of your life, it seemingly would take you a little over three years. So as you can imagine, we just get a taste of it. But beneath the facade of modernity, you just turn down a side street and you're instantly back in cultural Japan. The fantastic thing about Japan as a whole is that while it moves ahead and is a very modern and first world country, it retains its culture, its language, its traditions. It's a fantastic country. I mean, I, people think I always go on a bit over the top about it, but we've never ever had anyone who came on one of the trips and didn't come back as enamored with it as I am. Um, Kyoto, as I said, is um, a very hilly, hilly um, place, uh, but modern. We, there are traditional inns, but we stay in the modern hotels with all mod cons, Western um, restaurants. The alternative is always on offer there. The first day we go to um, the most famous garden in Japan, the Ryoji Garden. 
um, famous, the ideal garden for when you're 90, all you have to do is get out and rake the gravel and that's about it. Famous for its calmness, its tranquility. Uh, 15 rocks just placed in gravel representing islands of tranquility in the sea. Um, and yet they're never all visible at one time. It's incredible. It's a wonderful place to see at any time of year and also just beautiful to sit and quiet in tranquility just to meditate. It's interesting, no matter how many visitors, the minute they enter this area, it's calm. Of course, it's attached to a monastery with traditional um, tatami matting and traditional homes. Um, the little deer scare wells all around the gardens um, and the moss everywhere. Um, it was somewhere I had a tradition of never wanting to see anything dead in a garden. I mean, I think anything dead unless they killed it themselves. So all the time there are gardeners around clearing up constantly. The gardens like the rest of Japan are pristine. But of course, everywhere is cherry blossom. It's revered, it's the height, one of the highlights of the year. Not only is it admired by tourists, but it's also admired and, and valued by the Japanese themselves. We also move on then to the Garden of the Golden Pavilion, again, set in a beautiful forest area. It's, it's interesting, no matter where you go in Japan, you move away from civilization and suburbia very, very quickly, wherever there's a garden or wherever there's a particular place of interest, it's surrounded by trees and greenery. There's a great value placed on nature. Um, again, the main components of any garden, pines and rocks and water, everything is symbolic and symbolizes the whole way of life. And of course, the cherries flowering everywhere. Um, pines an important part. We also visit one of the original um, castles, Nijo Castle, one of the main homes of the samurai and the emperor when he lived in Kyoto. Fantastic wood carvings, again, gold plated and totally restored and maintained. There's a pristineness about Japan that's just wonderful. Um, I think we don't um, see it, always see in Ireland a good representation of their arts and crafts, but it's certainly on show everywhere in Kyoto particularly. Um, absolutely beautiful architecture and decoration on the older buildings. Um, each like the herons and cranes representing health and longevity. As I said, everything has a symbolism. Um, the rooms are open, able to spread out into one room. Anything that would be in the room is hidden away in cupboards. Um, the whole thing is to have an emptiness and a tidiness. You know, the father, of course, last year from Maria Kondo's tidy up. You can see what a tradition it comes from in Japan. Clutter doesn't enter at all. You're, you come back from Japan very aware of how much we have in our houses and how little we need. Um, this is the, we also visit um, shrines as well as temples. There are two main religions in Japan and most Japanese are both. Buddhist is of course for the sadder occasions like funerals, whereby Shinto is for um, celebrations like uh, blessings of children and uh, weddings. And before you enter the sh shrine, you have to purify yourself. As you can see, some of our group took it quite seriously and took part in the ritual. Um, Around, centered around the shrines and the castles are always the gardens. The gardens are divided into two main types. There's, there's lots of different sections on Japanese gardens, but basically there are viewing gardens, which are small ones that you view from the house. And then there's ones like these, which are the strolling gardens, which are wonderful to uh, walk around where the landscape represents the whole of nature and changes all of the time. And again, everywhere interrupted by a wooden building, wonderfully decorated, a tea house. And um, we go later on that day to the Hein Shrine, another um, Shinto shrine, 
with wonderful gardens and of course the pine trees as well and the cherries, two of the main symbols of Japan. Um, trellises are used above the head so you're constantly walking underneath the cherry tree to keep it away and just to be embraced by it I suppose. Um, people use it as a great occasion as Japanese love coming to uh, visit it and dress specially for the occasion in particular kimonos for the seasons whether it's either spring or autumn and again you view it from different areas it's uh, the, the gardens are framed either by windows or by structures. I mean, we tend to do it in Ireland with pergolas, but here they use pillars of a bridge so that you try and look at a whole picture through the frame. And of course, so many of the plants that we have in Ireland come from Japan. Um, when I started gardening about three hundred years ago and um, the only plant I knew was this one and everybody then called it japonica and I'm sure some people still do this is Shanomalies japonica and of course the second name means it comes from Japan and you uh, it'll be amazed if you walk around your garden and see how many plants we have that originated in Japan again another species another variety of uh, Shanomalies japonica here um, trained in all different ways, either as shrubs or on ground cover and as wall cover and even as small trees. Fantastic plants which are in flower at the moment here as well. Available easily, easy to grow as well. Do look out for them, they're fantastic. But particularly good if you live in a, a bungalow or uh, want a low wall in the garden covered, they're, they're wonderful. Flowering on bare wood, terrific. Um, originally, the um, most important place in Kyoto was just outside it, um, an hour's drive outside, and this is Nara, which is a natural forest, and in the middle of it is the home of the great wooden Buddha. On New Year's Eve, a bell rings in this temple 101 times to represent your misdeeds disappearing into the old year and a fresh year starting. There's barbecues and festivals and everything set up around this for the locals and they come in their throngs to celebrate. New Year is more important in Japan than Chris Christmas is, is now celebrated but probably like it is here without much re religious significance but uh, just to get the presents and the food. But in Japan, New Year's taken very seriously. Everything stopped for four days and they welcome the new year and the new season. Um, the Buddha is fantastic. Um, people, people have a, a very healthy attitude, I think, to religion. It doesn't govern their lives. It doesn't govern their laws as it did in Ireland at one time but they certainly appreciate it and go to pray and to thank for things and to offer up um, incense and that to the Buddha. There's a very nice feeling in both the temples and the shrines. And um, we move on now to Hasidir Shrine, and this is famous for its wonderful collection of Japanese lanterns, um, both the iron type and also the stone. Each one of these is donated by a family. Um, they can be quite expensive at special times of the year and on special occasions. A little candle is lit within them, so you can imagine what that's like in the evenings. But um, the, the sort of wealthier end of the citizens tend to donate one and support the shrine and keep the monks going. Both, they're both male and female monks, and it keeps them going. And uh, all the other um, the other thing is you can check by the shrines how old they are. If you see on the front, the pay, the person's name is is written on the front of the lantern, and there are different ages, but they're added to constantly. It's a fantastic sight. Um, one of the downsides, to my mind, though everybody else loves them, are the deer of um, Nara. Um, they're regarded as messengers of the gods. 
and they're allowed to go everywhere. They eat everything in sight. You're warned to keep things away. They eat maps and tickets and anything that you have in your hand. Um, you can, of course, feed them. There's, there are people who sell um, little, uh, you know, food and that for them, but um, they're disgustingly smelly. I'm not a, a great fan of them, but um, they're admired greatly. But um, and no one is allowed, of course, to go near them as they represent the gods. Um, another source of um, another source of revenue for the shrines are the owners of those who produce sake, and these are basically advertising, but they're also um, promoting and recommending that you drink their particular brand of sake, whether you attend the shrine or not. And of course, everywhere, although not in colour this time of year, are the fantastic maple trees. Really, really beautiful, worth seeing in the autumn. But even in their greenery in the spring, they're lovely. Um, bamboo is fantastic. There's everything in Japan can be made out of bamboo. And of course, people eat bamboo shoot shoots in the spring when they're coming up. And one of the things we do, we have free days in Kyoto. And people can go off on their own or alternatively, they could come with me. And each year I visit um, a few places. Um, and one of them, of course, is the bamboo forest, which is absolutely superb. It's, it's amazing. It's inspiring. We think our bamboos are big here, but they have to be seen. It's, it is actually a wonderful experience to walk. They have terrific paths all around them and you can walk through and then take a trip on the river. It's beautiful and uh, one of the loveliest uh, and one of the most um, tranquil experiences. There's also the most fantastic temples. This is Kiyomizu Temple, which looks over terrific views over the whole of Kyoto. And this is a structure made without nails, or any um, thing but joints uh, made by the monks originally and totally uh, made out of um, without any other materials. And one of the favorite days out for the groups, this is like a walk along the Grand Canal, except they call it the Philosopher's Path, a place where philosophers used to go years ago to meditate. Now people go to walk along beneath a canopy of cherries. It's about um, three miles long and we set out in the morning and we normally take uh, uh, quite a while to walk along because of the distraction of cafes and shops and things all along the way. It's just um, outside the suburbs, in the suburbs of Kyoto, so easily accessible from our hotel. Um, it's hard to keep people moving along. There's always something to distract them. The most beautiful handmade scarf shop. Um, and along the way, of course, there are the little small temples and shrines with their own individual gardens. Um, the moss gardens in Japan, they have the perfect climate for it. You think we have two here, and we do in Galway. I mean, Lorna McMahon's garden is one of the famous moss gardens in Ireland, but quite hard to create, but they're done effortlessly and beautifully in Japan. Um, the Japanese call cherry blossom pink snow. And when it's like this, here it's just coming to the end. Um, we actually follow the cherry blossom trail in Japan when you're going to for the autumn color. You move north to south following the colors it changes. But in the cherry blossom, we start in the south and as it finishes, we move north to catch up with it. But all along the trail as well, we see plants. This is Nandina domestica. I'm sure many of you grow it. Again, a Japanese plant. The fantastic Edgeworthy eye, which flowers here in April, but you tend to get it in gardens in Ireland flowering in February, known as the money tree, because the stems were originally used to make currency in Japan. So there is such a thing as money going on trees. And of course, one of our really common shrubs, um, Spirea japonica, this is bridal wreath, one of the most fantastic plants, I think, not used so much everywhere, but at one time it was in every garden. 
And of course, magnolias, here's a distinctive yellow one, but magnolias everywhere at this time. So there's always, wherever you go, you have plants. Um, absolutely, um, carpets of this is Iris japonica, um, a com almost a weed in Japan, but you see it in parks, just in droves all over the ground. The Iris season tends to be a little bit later in May. And again, that's a viewing season for the Japanese. But the common iris is the first one to appear and people love it. Um, on the philosopher's path, young people dress up in their best clothes and come out and walk along to experience the cherry blossom. And uh, they're always very nice and, um, and oblige us by um, posing, which is very, but this is sort of typical of what young people do in Japan on a, in cherry blossom time. Um, everywhere you go, there are Buddhist monks that are obliged to spend a year begging in the street, and they do it with, with great um, tenacity, just standing there for hours on end. Um, and of course, they're supported by everybody. And particularly in, Japo in Kyoto, of course, is famous for geishas, who despite what people think are not prostitutes, but highly trained musicians and dancers. Um, you very rarely see geishas out during the day, but the maikos, which are the apprentice geishas, are allowed out um, for walks and things like that, just to get used to their outfits and that. Um, it's a fantastic um, tradition and very young girls enter it from about 15 to 16. They're apprenticed to a house where there are about five or six others. Not everybody makes the grade. They must be able to sing. They must be able to dance. They must be able to um, say poetry. And of course, there's this very, very elaborate dressing and costumes. Um, they prefer, you try not to bother them, but they, if, you, if you ask them very politely, they will pose. But um, they're fantastic to look at and really beautiful. Um, in contrast, of course, there's Kyoto Station. And as we leave Kyoto Station, which is one of the biggest stations in Japan, we have the excitement of going on the bullet train or the Shinkansen. Not the fastest train, of course, now. It was at one time. It only goes 140, 150 miles an hour. And it's so fantastically running on time. Um, when it pulls into the station, you're already queuing up at your platform and you have precisely five minutes to get on. So um, we usually do it very quickly and flatten, everybody flattens. Of course, the luggage travels separately, so that's quite good. But within, within exactly five minutes, we're on that train and heading up for a break away from the city into the mountains. And we go to Hakone, our main point in going there, is just to see a different type of life and to see the, the countryside in Japan, which is just superb. Um, not too many people. There are some small villages up here, but people go for golf or they go for walking or that. Um, the Japanese are very into nature and weekends are a busy time. Um, we go, one of the places we go is to a beautiful garden and also, of course, to see the uh, crater lake filled in. This is from Mount Fuji, the, the base of Mount Fuji um, that has been filled with water. And of course, the um, Hakone Open Air Museum, where famous sculptures from all over the world are held, a fantastic um, wonderful museum with a Picasso library also. Um, just beautifully kept, very original and different and uh, a great interest. And of course, the highlight of our trip to the mountains is our banquet, our kaiseki in the evening. It's a big treat um, we get just to look at it. I mean, this is a real, a real example of you, you sort of see, eat with your eyes, so well presented with each little dish, almost like a still, well, is like a still life, absolutely lovely, um, so beautifully done. And of course, the bonus is when we see Mount Fuji, which doesn't always happen, 
Um, and if we don't see it here, we generally see it from our hotel, but it is lovely to see it when you're in the mountain. It's almost artificial. You imagine someone has just built it up behind the existing mountains, but it's fantastic. It is, um, Fuji is called the sacred mountain, and it is actually awe-inspiring to see. Wonderful. And um, we moved then to Tokyo, stopping on the way in a small fishing village called Kamakura, where we visit some smaller gardens and garden, small gardens attached to temples. And this is sort of typical of a small garden. You've got your pine trees and your shrubs. Everything is kept quite pruned and clipped. It's all to do with the size and balance and the rocks and the water here. Um, you sit and view things, but everything is planned around a lantern or the water or the, the little um, well. And the sand, of course, and raked gravel represents water where water isn't available. And of course, always the moss rather than the grass. Um, a more modern, this is attached to one of the temples, a more modern Japanese garden, but still keeping with the tradition of lantern, rocks, gravel, um, azaleas and uh, pine trees, and of course the Japanese cedar. Um, koi are a big part of the garden as well. And you, the whole thing is viewing it from the house. You create your garden for one view, which is lovely, ideal for the small garden. And of course, low maintenance as well. Um, there's always lots of buddhas and different things, but each shrine has a meaning. Lots of shrines dedicate themselves to one particular thing. And this is particularly poignant. This is a Jizu shrine, which is in the Hasidira, um, in the Hasidira shrine. And when you see these little figures, um, we always have to remind people to be very quiet because any Japanese people who are there putting flowers are um, mourning the death of their child. And um, these represent, all represent a child who's died, maybe a miscarriage, maybe an abortion, maybe um, later in life, but it's the children's shrine and it's treated with great reverence. Um, and of course, my favorite, one of my favorite um, men in the world is the great Buddha of Kamakura, out in all weathers, a fantastic structure. And again, surrounded by beautiful gardens. Um, we head then for Tokyo. Um, we do this journey um, on a coach. Um, so it's fantastic. You get to see a lot of the Japan. And entering Tokyo is um, quite a change. It's a very modern city, a city of 126 million people, but yet it has still retains a great order. It's not like people say, where's the center? There is no center. There's different parts of Tokyo for different things. And yet always there's access to a garden. This is part of the palace garden. And um, the Imperial Palace is, is dominates the city. Um, but the gardens are accessible to everybody. But the, it's such a contrast to see these huge structures and try and imagine what it was like, you know, hundreds of years ago. This is looking out where everywhere there's greenery. Um, it's the great thing about Tokyo. Um, and not the, it's totally lacking the pollution that one finds in uh, China or Beijing or somewhere like that. Um, there's not so many cars, public transport, 93% of people use public transport, which is very easy to manage. And the gardens of the hotel, this is about six o'clock in the morning, the gardeners come out and sweep their lawns. So I think this is a habit you should all develop if you have a lawn, makes such a difference. Um, the, Tokyo, of course, is consisted of islands um, and you can take a lovely cruise around the bay. and. This is Ginza, one of the most famous streets in Japan. Fantastic for shopping, if you like that. And uh, pedestrianized at the weekend. So one of the places people go. And then this is another um, area we visit, Asakusa, which has shrines and also traditional market stalls and food and that. So it's very popular with people. Um, again, with the wonderful temples ruling over it. And um, one of my favorite areas, it's called the Paris of Tokyo. This is Harajuku, very um, 
very quiet, nice shops and just very pleasant near one of the lovelier parks and uh, with an old station and that, um, very civilised. It's a lovely area. Um, it also has one of the, there's many woodblock. I'm sure you're all familiar with the wonderful woodblocks from Japan. This is one of the, the Ota Woodblock Museum, which is one of the loveliest galleries there, which we also visit. Um, we spend one afternoon in Wayno Park, where you have the option of visiting the National Museum, which is a fantastic collection of everything to do with Japan, kimonos, natsuki, anything you might like, or the Natural History Museum, or of course, just wander through the gardens of the park. This is the Peony Garden, where they use sunshades because of the excessive heat to make the peonies last a little longer. I thought, think they're beautiful. We should all do this, of course. Um, it's interesting, despite the busy streets, whenever you turn, there are little side streets in Japan and people are very keen on their gardens. It's very small spaces, but wherever there's a space, there's something growing, um, no matter what it is. And there, there's absolutely no vandalism. Um, tiny little pots outside every door, you know, quince growing in a small pot, just really lovely, but with greenery everywhere. And of course, once you're in a park or a garden, you have the extensive grounds and waters to wander around. Um, they're really inspiring. Um, this is one of the larger parks in Tokyo. And again, we go there to view the cherry blossom and to walk around the strolling garden. The azaleas are just usually coming on our last days and they are of course kept unlike ours which are allowed to go they're kept clipped so you have these beautiful banks of color and always the pines which represent are one of the main representations of japan cloud pruning i'm sure you've all seen this and they do the pines in this form three times a year each one is hand pruned and gardeners are everywhere at all times, parks, and gardening is a very highly regarded profession in Japan. Um, people that come to Japan worry about the food. <clears throat> and my main thing is it's, it's not all raw fish. This is sashimi, not sushi. And raw fish is delicious, but people worry that's all they're going to get to eat. But it is a first world country. Um, most people um, are slightly put off by Japanese food, but they get to try it and it's very easy to order. You just point in the window. These are plastic replicas of the dishes on offer. You just point to what you want. And most of our group make a, a fist of using chopsticks and or they can opt for knives and forks, whichever you like. And if you really want it, there's their traditional breakfast with your cup of tea. And of course, a, a recognizable cake. So food is, is never an issue. And the ice creams are ice creams, if, if a little different. One of the things I recommend everybody tries are the, are the green tea ice creams, which are, um, you don't really see much around Ireland, actually. But uh, our, one of our final days is when we visit the bonsai garden in Tokyo, and this is what we call our cultural day, where we meet this nice group of women who um, give us flower demonstrations um, and insist that everybody try it, we, men and women. Um, and people have good fun and they try it and then they get them. Um, they're, they're quite good, the women, because they don't just say everybody's great. They tell them how rubbish they are and try and adjust it. And of course, our guide is always the best person to, to do it. And we also have um, a tea ceremony. This usually takes, um, if you do it properly, take, can take eight hours, but we vote for the shorter um, half an hour version. But it's interesting, they explain how it's done and the cups and how the tea is made and what tea is used. And then, of course, we see some of the fantastic bonsai. Um, one of them, of course, is with Steri. And as usual, we have our great guide, Haruko-san, who's been with us for a good few years. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody coming back again. Um, and within that area, there are, of course, the lovely Japanese gardens, again, that we can wander around. And um, the, the fantastic moss gardens, too. And always, always the cherry blossom in all its forms. 
And you see, particularly at the weekends, all the office workers come out in their kimonos and have fun and have picnics and that. And this is an interesting site during the week. You see, it's the youngest member of the office staff, which would probably be Kira, our marketing person. And he sent out at nine o'clock in the morning and he puts down this area and he holds it till the evening. And in the evening, the park is full of office workers. They come for their party where they have food and drinks and sit under the cherry blossom and admire it. Um, one of the days we also go to um, Kabuki, which is traditional Japanese theatre. Again, um, two acts, one for four hours in the morning, one for four hours in the afternoon. But we do the taste of Kabuki. All male actors, a lot of them, it's a tradition within their family. One of the most famous is Koshiro and his father and grandfather were actors. And it's a fascinating um, experience. We go for an hour in the mornings to uh, check it out. In Japan is unique. There's sort of some very quirky things. One of the great things is the total lack of litter. It's more obscene to eat in the street than I think to murder somebody. Um, you never see, people just don't eat in the street. It's one of the most vulgar things, hence the lack of litter. It would be a great idea if Ireland took on that. Um, if you do buy an ice cream, there's a little seat to sit and eat the ice cream or drink or whatever, but you don't certainly wander eating and drinking. And of course, in most of the shrines and in some of the restaurants, you're required to take your shoes off when you go in. Uh, translation doesn't always work, but then I doubt many of us could write anything in Japanese. Um, I always laugh when I take people away. We see wonderful sights, but what they go on about are the fantastic toilets, which play music, have endless, um, have heated seats at different things, have showers included, and generally um, perform many functions that seem a little bit unnecessary. But this one um, in particular is in a cafe we go to in Harajuku. And as you open the door, the seat goes up and somebody says, welcome. I think I could do without that. Um, it's the simple things that are so beautiful in Japan. You have to learn your eye to move to detail. This nobody puts don't enter. A simple rock tied with string indicates that you don't go on a path like this. And people recognize it and turn away. Um, you view everything through a frame, as I said earlier, so your door can shift across and you see your garden in different ways, particularly if it's not a big garden, you block off part of it and look at another. And always everything can be done on a smaller scale when you think how many of us um, would love to grow wisteria and look at the size of this in a pot, it's all down to feeding and root pruning. Um, and a simple little Japanese lantern and the flowers placed on top to draw your attention to the fact that the camellia is finishing. And of course, endless, endless, endless cherry blossom. And um, thank you very much to everybody for your tolerance and listening to this. I could go on for days about Japan. It's just so wonderful. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. I'd like to thank Kira and Patrick who were great and helped me when my computer's been giving problems and they have been wonderful sorting out all my issues. Um, we're doing, 20, we're doing uh, 16 tours next year with Travel Department. They're on the website, 16 Garden Tours, um, led by either myself or Ian and uh, everything from Ireland to Japan. So um, I look forward to me. Thank you to anyone who I know who listened in this evening. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much.